I find it very hard to watch myself on screen. Although like I force myself to because sometimes I feel like I learn from it. So I use it as, you know, a, a training ground in a way. A lot of times you don't get paid for what you do because it takes so many auditions to even book a single job. But there's a lot of blood, sweat and tears that go into it and you're working long hours. You can't even remember your name, let alone your lines. <laughs> Sometimes you're working in inclement weather. It's not as sexy as, as people think. You know, they, they look at the outside and they think it's bright and it's shiny, but there's a lot beneath the surface. You're listening to part two of my awesome conversation with Danielle Vasanova, an actor, producer, entrepreneur, avid equestrian, and drummer. If you haven't yet listened to part one, be sure to check that one out first. Without further ado, here's part two with the amazing Danielle Vasanova. So, so you talk about spiraling, right? One thing leads to the next. So young and restless, boom, you know, dream, this shit never happens, but it happened to you. Great role, what happened next? I had to find an agent and find a manager and then reality hit, you know, so it wasn't just, you know, boom, 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 everything is gravy, everything is puppy dogs and ice cream. It's like, no, now the work starts, right? right. Now I've really got to figure this out. And, and if I want to do this, I need to get a good team and start auditioning and bump the grind. Well, you had the young and the restless on your resume right out of the gate. It, it was yeah. So I got tapped highly, like you did. Right. I mean, right? that show for good. you know for those people who don't know, started in 1973. Had been on the air now 50 years exactly. Um, 15,000 shows, and for 32 years, it was the number one soap opera in the United States consecutively. Not too shabby. It's crazy. Yeah. And that's your first building block on your resume. Yeah. So was it easy it's to get it? It's kind of like working with Sharon Stone, you know? Well. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite. Yours yeah. is cooler. <laughs> well, uh, you, you actually got paid for yours. I mean, I, I did. my. You uh, didn't get paid? Oh, I, I did. I made whatever the Taft Harley was. I think it was $700 or something yeah, like, like that. Yeah, like scale for the day. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I get uh, residual checks. I'm, I'm not exaggerating and I'm not, I'm not bragging about this, but my last residual check, 21 cents. Oh, yeah. I think I've literally gotten <laughs> a one cent check before. I'm like, why? You have why? to deposit like, it just on principle. <laughs> it you, you, it you, caused them more to send it. Yeah. Yeah. You have to, right? Right. So, mm -hmm. okay, reality sets in. I mean, you had the big show, but was it super easy to get an agent? Uh, no. And I went through a series of managers and a series of agents after that. You know, I didn't know. Like, I thought that you get an agent and get your manager and that's who you work with and that's your team. I didn't know that, you know, you kind of roll through it. How long was it before you got your next role? And what were you doing during that time to keep yourself busy and keep your mental sanity? Exactly. No, I got a job. There was um, uh, a restaurant in Sunset Plaza called Clef Louti. Okay. This French restaurant. Yeah. And I got a job there. But when I was living in Van Nuys, um, I f tripped and I fell down the stairs and I broke my toe. And so then I couldn't work at Clef Luti anymore. And so I got a job just like being an extra and wearing shoes on my one foot that were two sizes too big for me just so that my, my toe would fit in it. <laughs> and I just told the AD, I'm like, look, just can you put me in the back like reading a book or something? Because I can't, I can't do these crosses. I can't do these passes, you know? And so that's how, because I needed to make money, I needed to pay, pay the bills. And so that's how, um, that's how I paid my rent for a little while. And, and if I could, you know, if they would send me out for an audition, I'd have to go and, you know, miss work and go audition and try to juggle. So sometimes things come up very quickly. You've got to act super quickly. Yeah. You got to be ready. So tell us about this call you got at, um, I think it was from your agent. Jeannie Baccarat, if I have the if I have the name right, getting your passport together. No, you're funny that you knew that. Yeah, no, I um, I got a call. I think it was on a Friday, and it was a last minute audition. And I I hustled through traffic. I went to this casting. 
I decided to play this character just like kind of off the wall and I put a piece of gum in my mouth and she was real edgy and uh, she kind of, I could see her kind of clock me, like she liked what I did and then she's like, okay, do this. Go back for a second because you're, you're way past the story of, let's slow-mo the story. Okay. You had never seen the script, you had never read for the script and you had to it was audition a, and then it was an NBC show they sent me the sides but it was same day audition same day audition right yeah okay, so, so I didn't have a lot of time to prep it okay you know so I was kind of just flying by the seat of my pants okay and your hair was blonde so talk to us about that my hair was blonde yeah I was going through some some you know quarter life crisis and I was like oh, I'm dyeing my hair blonde like you know screw it da 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 and so, yeah, they dyed it bleach blonde. Actually, that was for a job. And then, but my hair was fried. It was so fried. It looked horrible. Um, anyway, and so, yeah, I just like put it up in a ponytail and I put a piece of gum in my mouth and I created this character. And uh, so I kind of did a cold read. She gave me an adjustment. I did it again. She's like, okay, now lose the gum. And then I did it again. She's like, okay, that was it. Left the room. They call me at like, my manager calls me at like six o'clock. He's like, your passport's up to date, right? And I said, yeah. He goes, you got the job. You're going to South Africa on Sunday. I was like, oh, what? That's the day after tomorrow. He's like, pack your bags. You're, you're going. And uh, it was uh, one of the most magical, crazy, cool experiences of my, my life. And, and I totally thought that that was it. You know, and then I was off to the races and I went to the airport and I remember uh, Paolo, I can never say his name right, Paolo Coelho Yeah. Uh, from The Alchemist. Yep. Uh, I, I saw this book on the Barnes & Noble bookshelf at the airport and it said, The Winner Stands Alone. And I remember feeling like that. I remember feeling like, wow, I'm on this NBC show going to you know, a foreign land and I'm by myself and what's going to happen? And I felt so grateful and so excited, but also like very lonely. Cause I didn't know anybody and I didn't know what I was walking into. So it was, it was kind of scary. It was cool, but it was very scary for me. So the fright was you're going to a movie set. You don't know anybody and you don't, you're afraid of being alone and you're afraid of being isolated. Yeah. No, I mean, excited, but also kind of scared. You know, I just felt like, like that book, the winner stands alone. I felt like, wow, this is a great triumph for me, but I'm, like, like, where is everyone? <laughs> you know, it's just me. So that was a pivotal moment in your career. Yeah. And then from there, it, it, you, you've worked on, on and off for a while. I thought I would just be back to back. Like I thought the offers would be coming in and it was just gonna go crazy. And then I think I didn't work for almost four or five months after I got back. Just crickets. And that's how it is. It just kind of ebbs and flows. Nothing is guaranteed. So how do you plan your life? Exactly. With, <laughs> My question, exactly. With that, I mean, financially. Exactly. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, did you buy a house at this point or were you thinking of just keeping the expenses low, just yeah. saving for a rainy day? I mean. Yeah, I've always, I mean, I, I grew up with nothing. And so I've always kind of um, been like a little squirrel. And so I'm used to living pretty close to the vest and so I just kept my nose to the grindstone and just kept on you you've you had jobs on, on and off and you want to continue to act continue to make money continue to build your career I remember a friend of my wife was an actress the only parts she could get were parts in her husband's movies mm -hmm. then she had a chance to be on Melrose Place Okay. The first Melrose Place. Okay. The one that was super popular. Erin Spelling, biggest producer. Who'd she, she play? She had a chance ah. and didn't take it. Stop it. Because it was too lowbrow for her. She was a real actress and wasn't and, what, and didn't want to be on the show. I mean, Erin Spelling at that point was a I mean, that, went, that show went on forever. Forever. Residuals. Ton, yeah. Famous. Could get lots of roles. But she was worried about not getting roles and not being treated seriously mm -hmm. as an actress. Right. And was just high on, on her horse. She couldn't recognize, by the way, that the only part she got were her husband's movies. 
but this was a huge opportunity. It wasn't him, and she said no. And so they offered her the part? They offered her the part, wow. and she turned it down. Wow. Did she regret that? I haven't talked to her, and I, I don't know. I mean, I can't imagine she didn't regret it. But sometimes you say no to movies. You said no to the Danica Patrick movie, and the answer is why? Tell us about the movie. Why would you say no? Danica, the, yeah, it's weird. Danica Patrick has come up a couple times in my life. They wanted to groom me to be a jockey, actually, before I got into acting. And they, were, they said to me, oh, I want to, we want to make you like the Danica Patrick of horse racing. Um, I didn't do that because, you know, when I went to the barn and I talked to some of the other jockeys and some of the trainers, it's not if you're going to get hurt, it's when. And you have to be a 106 strips, so you're a buck 20 with the tack, and you have to make weight, and it's a lot of pressure. And so I said no to being a jockey and being kind of the Danica Patrick of horse racing because of that, you know, and maybe I would want to go on and have a family one day. And I figured, you know, uh, I don't know, maybe that wasn't the best career path. But there was another Danica Patrick movie that I did want to do. And the whole movie ended up falling apart. I don't know if, if it was because she didn't win this one of the races and so they wouldn't have this, you know, climactic end to the movie. I, I think they wanted her to be a little bit further on in her career. And so the de in the development phase, it just fell, fell apart. But I would, have, I would have done that. So let's switch gears, talk about challenges. We've all had challenges in our life. We talked about- I thought life. we've been talking about the challenges. Well, well okay, okay. <laughs> all more, of these are challenges. More, more serious challenges, right? I, <laughs> okay. I told you about my health scare. Yes. And how, you come out of there and I'm grateful. Um, and so I you could have died. You could have, you could not the, be here right now. The crazy thing about that is a woman that I knew that I was friends with, that we worked together when I was a lawyer way back at the beginning of my career, I got out of the hospital and she died five days later. Mm -hmm. I went to her funeral and I thought, oh mm -hmm. my God, like this could be my funeral. Mm -hmm. And I learned later that she died of myocarditis. You know, yeah, she'd gone Same running and, and it was rare. It was mm. weird. And I remember being at her funeral and she had five year old twins and her husband just, you know, couldn't even speak. Um, How quickly did, does it escalate? Does it, does it come on fast or does it take years? She to... went on a run um, and came back and didn't wake up. She said she was really tired and she came, mm. came back and you didn't wake up. In my case, it just felt like a flu that was getting worse and worse and worse. Mm. Where, you know, shit, something's seriously wrong. Mm. But you had something seriously wrong with you as well. Tell us the story about how you died for three minutes. 12-12-2019. Died. Three minutes. Um, the doctors couldn't tell. My, my mom flew in from New York. They couldn't tell her that I was going to live. I went, I went to downtown LA, I went to um, urgent care and I, cause I kind of was feeling like I had a cold. And so they did a bunch of tests and they said that I had strep and sent me home with a Z-Pack. And then cut to the next day, I, I was supposed to go to Vegas to do a commercial for MGM. And uh, I had actually asked my uncle Rob to, my brother lives in Vegas and I had asked my uncle Rob to come out and take care of him because he has kidney stones and he needed to get his kidney stones blasted and so he needed help and I wasn't there because I was here in LA and uh, anyway, long story short, I woke up the next morning, I couldn't, I felt like I couldn't walk and my uncle Rob left Vegas, flew to me, drove my car back and I was like very sick the whole way, vomiting all the way back to Vegas, got there, they put me on an IV drip. In the middle of the night, um, I, it was like two o'clock in the morning and I woke my brother up and I said, I, we need to go to the hospital. I feel like, I think I'm going to die. And he was like, okay, you know, put your boots on, put your coat on. And I'm like, you don't understand. We got to go. And he got me, he took me to the hospital, uh, this one called St. Rose. And, um, he let me out, went around to park the car and he came back in. He said it was like a scene out of a movie. The whole, this one light, at the end of the hallway was illuminated and everybody was just rushing to this room. And then he saw, you know, the machine and 
all of these people around talking. This one girl, uh, he, later on he found out her name was Ruby and she got on top of me and she was like pumping, pumping, pumping away, trying to get a heartbeat going and he saw the thing go to three minutes. Finally, she got a heartbeat back. They transferred me from St. Rose to San Martin and um, they had to induce coma. Uh, they had to, I had complete organ failure. They've cut my sides, put lung tubes in, cut a pericardial window, and my mom flew in from New York. They couldn't tell her anything, if I was gonna pull through or, or not. They didn't know what was wrong with me. And uh, this went on for almost a month. I was there until New Year's 2020, when I finally got discharged. And uh, I, when I, they must have taken me off of whatever, you know, drugs they had had me on. I was on the ventilator and I was on, you know, all these, whatever they had me on. And I guess I started, I like movies, right? And so the one guy came in from, you know, to, to do all of the brain tests and they're like, you know, what's your name? And, and you know, how old are you? And, you know, who's the president of the United States? All of this. And, and when he asked me how old I was, I, I, I was like, I'm 97, but I look a lot younger. And it's a scene, it's a um, quote from Benjamin Button. So oh. I thought that I was being so funny and that I was rattling off this, you know, something from the Benjamin Button, the movie. But the guy did not think it was funny, the doctor. And he was like looking like, oh God, this is, this is not good. <laughs> she might be gone. Um, anyway, that, last, that lasted for like a couple of days. And I was talking like a child and I thought everything was so funny. It was bizarre. But I ended up, I came out of that. Those drugs flushed themselves through my system. And then uh, soon after that, I was discharged. But I was very, 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 very lucky. One of the first cases of COVID in the United States. Came on so hard and so fast and so strong. Yeah. Did they tell you you had COVID or no one really knew what they it was? They were at baffled the at what, the, what it was. And the only thing I had done differently that week was go to a rock climbing gym like an indoor rock climbing gym. I had never been to one before. My friend took me and I don't, they probably don't really clean too much in those, you yeah. know, nooks. Um, and that's, I, I don't know. I don't know where else it would have come from, but yeah. Did your outlook on life change when you got out? You were 90 pounds when you got out of the hospital. I, yeah, I had to relearn how to walk. Um, I couldn't work because my brain was so cloudy and I just, everything was new to me again, you know? Yeah. And I didn't have an NDE, but they say that they, that can come back later in life, which is, who knows? Maybe I will, maybe I won't, I don't know. But yeah, I mean, I had over a million dollars in medical bills. I had lost my SAG insurance that year because I had a really bad year. And if you don't make, you know, a, if, you, if you don't make it one year, they kick you off. It's not like, oh, you had, you know, two years, three years in a row that like weren't good. It's like, no, you don't make the, the cut one year and you don't have insurance. And so I was switching over from SAG to Blue, Blue Shield or Blue Cross Blue Shield. Anyway, so I was looking at stacks of bills. I was seeing, you know, medical bills of over 500,000, 70,000, 200, I mean, just coming in and it was so stressful. And I was just lucky to be alive. And I had to basically start over again. Did you have a completely new outlook on life when you got home and said, I'm going to live? And how did that experience change your outlook? I don't even think at that time that I was even, you know, really thinking, I was so grateful to, to be alive 100%, but I was literally trying to get up the first stair to get in my apartment, you know? I couldn't even walk up a whole set of stairs without getting winded. So it was, it was like, wow, here I am. And I almost have to relearn everything as a, a child would in a way. And I didn't know where I was going to go or what I was going to do or how I was going to make money or anything. When I got out of the hospital, I got home. I thought, gosh, you know, I have a new outlook on life. And I just got on my friend's funeral. And I said, shit, like all the aggravating stuff that happens 
in our lives is irrelevant. It's irrelevant, right? My life's going to change. I've, I've been, uh, and then three months later, you go back to what you were doing and you kind of forget some of the lessons there. But then you think, okay, you know, he brought me back for a reason, right? And what's my purpose? Like, did you have a greater found sense of purpose after that? It was more of a, I'm grateful. Um, yeah. You know, it's, it's, I had, Same. I, I, I was living my dream, you know, I had started a successful company and I was, you know, you take had, no no day for granted, right? No, I mean no and, and, hour for granted no, I mean, because again, you don't know when it's going to go. No, you you know, like I was living in my dream house. I had made a bunch of money. Yeah, you know, I had a, a wonderful uh, family. You know, I had three young kids at the time, and just kind of appreciate what you have. Sometimes you're just so far in the rat race, and I work mm -hmm. long hours and very long hours. Today, even seventy hours a week, usually minimum, and it's. Sometimes but just, that's your choice. That is a choice. Um, it's for sure a, a choice, but it, 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 it helps bring things back to reality and helps you focus on what's really important in life. And my family was the most important and I just needed to slow down for a while. Mm -hmm. I did slow down for a while, but then I turned it back up in the fifth gear maybe a few months later. That's just... That's I, just who you are, yeah, right? That's, that's, but it makes you appreciate the little things and it makes completely. you appreciate the people around you. Completely. And, and that's what really me, you know, that's truly what life is, love and, and, and family and experiences and, and helping other people, right? For sure. Let's talk about the life of being an actor. Everyone dreams at some point in their life or thinks about what it's like to be famous. And you go to the movies, you see yourself on the big screen and you say, gosh, one day I'd love to do that. They think it's sexy. They think you make a lot of money, and they think it's easy. Mm -hmm. What's the reality? None of those. <laughs> I find it very hard to watch myself on screen, although like I force myself to because sometimes I feel like I learn from it. So I use it as you know a, a training ground in a way, but it's uncomfortable. Uh, a lot of times you don't get paid for what you do because it takes so many auditions to even book a single job right so say you're working for scale for the day so you're working for a thousand bucks right just under a thousand bucks but maybe you've done 20 auditions right and put in 20 hours before that so you're really you're not making any money until you until you start to you know become a series regular and things you know one thing leads to the next and the next and you test for network and then your your rate starts to go up but there's a lot of blood sweat and tears that go into it and you're working long hours as you know i mean i think i did one day i think we worked like it it was like golden hour. i mean we went into like 22 hours all through the night you're tired you, you can't even remember your name let alone your lines <laughs> sometimes you're working in inclement weather um all different things it's it's not as sexy as as people think, you know, they, they look at the outside and they think it's bright and it's shiny, but there's a lot beneath the surface. So how many takes do you do in a movie? I mean, you're, you're part of a scene, right? Let's mm -hmm. say there's five people in the scene. How many times do people fuck up and it's not you and you got to recut the whole thing? Oh yeah. I mean, it depends on the director. Some directors move quick and they figure out a way to cut around it or, you know, whatever, but um, they still have to get coverage and it depends on how many cameras they're, they're using. But I mean, you could do, you could do, you know, five takes, you could do 17 takes. It, it depends on, it depends. You could be there for a long time. I'm going to be doing some paid corporate speaking on the top of, of extreme preparation, which we're going to talk about in a couple minutes. Okay. And it's, my speech is 39 pages. Wow. And I, it's You wrote it? Yep, I wrote it. It's an hour. Are you memorized or do well, you have a prompter? I'm, I'm, no, I'm memorizing it. Okay. And it's taken me months, months, maybe six months. I'm almost. How do you even memorize that much? It, it's, like, well, 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 my question to you is going to be how do actors memorize so many lines so quickly, especially when they're doing weekly shoots? I mean, I, I can see a movie where you've got months to, to prepare, but. 
How, so how? soap opera actors, yeah. usually they shoot over 100 pages a day. So a series regulars on soaps usually do about 20, 25 pages a day. On big action movies, Wait, they're depends. memorizing that? Every day. Every, how? I don't know. It, it becomes like a, like a muscle. You just do it. There's no teleprompter uh, anywhere nope. on the, on the nope. set? Nope. Nope. I mean, some of these scenes are... And they're shooting are, with a lot of different cameras, so they're getting every angle so they can move quick. So how do you do it? Repetition. I am not a good... I'm not good at memorizing. Um, for me, it's, it's, it depends because if it's good writing, it's a lot easier to memorize than if it's, you know, not. <laughs> um, or if you're in a show where there's a lot of medical jargon or things like that and you don't know these terms, right? If it doesn't make sense in your brain, you're just, you're just repetition, repetition, repetition. That's the only way. I mean, I went and shot a sizzle reel for my speaking website that we're going to do and Maybe I did 20 minutes of the sizzle reel, and my colleague Matt and I is over there, one of the producers of my show, who's awesome. We rented a um, stage in Santa Monica, the Santa Monica Theater. I'd go there and I would practice. Not only do you have to memorize it, but you have to make it seem natural. You got to right. the inflection points. Right? Yeah. So it's not just memorizing it, right. which is still difficult, but it's actually your performing something right. with different people. It's right. hard. But you can remember, you can memorize it by, uh, think of it like a story, right? And so you can visualize what's going on. You can kind of remember those bullet points of yeah. how it transitioned and then start to go back and fill in the gaps, right? So what does it take to be successful, to be an actor, and are the elements the same to be successful in life? Yeah, I mean, it's funny because I even still, I, I work, but I, I still don't feel like I've reached the level that I would like to get to. So I think it's this constant, you know, almost state of like dissatisfaction with myself that fuels the drive because I think I can do better. Uh, I want to, you know, work with this director or work with this, you know, this actor or, um, I never feel, I, I feel like it's, it's about the climb, right? It's not the destination, it's the journey. And so I think a lot of those cross over into life because I also have a very curious soul. I think you're kind of like that too. I think, you know, that fuels your entrepreneurial spirit. And I think it, there is a lot of crossover there. What are the elements that it takes to be successful as an actor and then I, I mean, I mean, discipline, discipline, a lot of discipline, um, drive, uh, punctuality. If you're not early, you're late. Or if you're on time, you're late. If you're early, you're on time. If you're early, you're on time. That's what I meant. Yeah. <laughs> if you're on time, the you're late. The dyslexia yeah. is kicking in. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, what else? I think consistency. I mentioned earlier in the show today that one of the ingredients or characteristics that's contributed to my success, probably the most important thing is preparation, but not the kind of preparation okay. most people think about, something I call extreme preparation. Mm. I'm writing a book by the same title and that's going to be the topic of my paid corporate uh, speaking and I also do one-on-one -on -one coaching on it as well. I coach. Mm -hmm coach professional athletes, I've coached young professionals, wealth managers, investment bankers. And what do you tell all of them? It's, it's uh, when someone prepares one hour for something, I'll probably prepare 20, right? My goal is to be the most prepared person who's ever walked into that room mm. with somebody. Mm -hmm. I'm 99% successful. When you do that, you'll be able to achieve dramatically faster results, results that would not have been possible and which people think are impossible. Do you believe you're lucky? You create your own luck. You, well, number one, yes. Of course I've been lucky. Mark Cuban was on my show and he said, um, you can't be a billionaire if you're not lucky. But I think every successful person has had luck. I mean, I've had a lot of people on my show. Most of them are incredibly humble and most of them attribute uh, some degree of luck to their success. Now the flip side of that is you create your own luck. 
I mean... Yeah, if you didn't reach out to those people, if you didn't, you know, send those crazy presents, I, right? I, I send crazy <laughs> presents. I sent letters to 300 CEOs, got meetings with Sumner Redstone, Michael Eisner, the head of every studio, cold letters because my letter was different than any letter they'd ever received. People... And what people, did you write in your letter that was different? It was a crazy letter. It started with a quote that the CEO had given at some point in their career was a big curse of letters. Um, the key to Disney is how we hire. Michael Eisner, Time Magazine, I still remember June 21st, 1996, that was the cover. It had okay. a plastic cover. It had, I went on LexisNexis, there was no Google back then. And I, re, I created a list of 300 people. So. Michael Eisner, Sumner Redstone, Mark Platt, Stacy Snyder, these people all ran studios at the time. Mike Matavoy, who I've since become friends with. You've probably met him, oh, he's wow. a great guy. I've never, yeah, I've never met him. Um, and I incorporated every job they had ever had in their career into a single paragraph. And I basically said, you've done X, Y, I mean, A, B, C, D, and sometimes it, it went to W, but it was every job. I mean, every promotion, every this, every mm -hmm. that and then said, I want an informational interview, not a job interview, where a letter would find a shredder to talk about getting advice for how to transition from a legal to a business-related career. Okay. My letter had tabs, it had my single-space three-page letter, it had my transcripts from college, I, I did very well academically, I graduated top 1% of my class at Michigan, at Northwestern, I also did very well, I had letters of recommendations, and then I had this newspaper piece that had been written about me in college for a TV show, um, a, a weekly TV show. We were one and done, but there was a nice write-up. Um, and then it had a cellophane cover and was wrapped in one of those three, those uh, small plastic spiral binders. Wow. And I got, and, and people said- Are you said, human? When, when I grow up, can I be like you? Well, I, but, <laughs> but these are all things, by the way, that yeah. I teach. And okay. they're simple. Okay. Right? They're, they're, they're easy. You can do it. I've told you how to do it right now. Right? And it's very easy. You create a spreadsheet of people you want to meet. You do your research. You create your, now it's easy, right? You got Google. Uh, it's so easy to do it right now, and nobody does it. I got a letter three days ago from this guy named Miguel Perez. I haven't met him yet. And he did a me. He sent me a letter in a cellophane cover that was tabbed that had everything I had in my letter. By the way, I've talked about it, but not a lot. Not the details. I mean, this is, so much, this is more detail than I've ever gone into on, on, on my show, wow. all right? Period. But he did it. And he FedExed it and he said, which it, so this is easy too, right? You have a meeting, you want to send a, th a thank you note, right? I'm going to send an easy email. It's easy, right? Why go easy? Do a handwritten thank you note. And yeah, we're on a Zoom when they're in New York. FedEx the thank you note. Mm. You spent all that time preparing for the interview or the meeting. It's 20 bucks. Yeah. For 20 bucks, yeah. you'll be the only person who's ever sent someone a FedEx thank you note, that person's gonna remember you forever. There's 100 people for that job. You know, my daughter worked at uh, CAA last summer. I think they had like 6,000 applications for the summer for yeah. something like 40 jobs. You know, you gotta do people, things that people don't do, mm. right? FedEx the thank you letter. But, you know, it, it's, I tell you about the letter writing campaign, it's easy. You just gotta be willing to do the work. That's it. And so you asked me about, extreme preparation. I mean, each letter took five hours. Yeah. So you got so many people doing spray and pray, right? You send the same cover letter, you change the name, you change the company. And they say, oh my God, I spent so much time and no one responds to my yeah. application. Of course they don't. Who, who, who would respond to that application, right? Versus mm. someone sends a, a crazy letter like that. Mm. You know, I, I called a guy yesterday, Miguel, and um, it went to voicemail, so I texted him. I, you know, doesn't have my number, and he texted me back. Oh my gosh, you know, Mr. Kaplan, I didn't think you would respond. I texted him back. How could anyone in the world not respond? Yeah. Right. It's yeah. a no-brainer. So my question to you is, flipping it around, how has extreme preparation 
played a role in the success in your life? I don't think that I would have been able to climb a ladder, so to speak, if I hadn't done that work. I don't think I would have been able to, you know, attract that team or get in the rooms with those casting directors to then get those jobs if I, if I didn't do that work. Give me an example of a time where you used extreme preparation, just went so far above and beyond anybody else and you had a successful outcome. Hmm. I have to think about that. We'll we come, back, come to back. We'll, we'll come back to that one. I have to, come think, back I have to, to think about that. That's a good question. I like that. Are you going to be my mentor? I, I, <laughs> Are you by, my mentor now? <laughs> the, well, by the way, one, one, one of the great things about my show that I love is a lot of people like you, who I didn't know, Sharon Stone, uh, and the Tysons, Mike and Kiki, his wife, I've become close to and friends with. And they've done so many nice things for me, and I like doing nice things for them. So I've I've mentored a lot of my, um, you know, my guests. Um, they, they mentor me and they teach me about things that I know nothing about. They're doing me huge favors mm -hmm. by being on my show, helping me grow my show. Mm -hmm. They do super nice things like posts. Mike Tyson put up a permanent post on his um, Instagram, not a story, but a, a permanent post. I okay. mean, he, he's got 40 million followers. I mean, yeah. you know, that's incredible. Oh, yeah. You know, it doesn't have to do that. And, and there's nothing for the Tysons that I wouldn't do. Yeah, that's amazing. Know? And, and it's, it's, been, it's been fun, but I love mentoring people. I love coaching people. Oh, I love it. Live for we, it. You really? Which is one of the goals you can of my see, show. Yeah, and you can, see, you can see the results, right? You can see them grow. Immediate. Immediate? It, it's immediate. Wow. We, we have um, some guy, Christian, I'm not going to mention your last name, uh, reach out to me on Instagram. Um, he said, I, I listen to your show. He's a dentist in Grand Rapids, Michigan. He's making um, mid six figures, comfortable, okay. pediatric dentist, international violinist at age 14. Wow. Full from Brazil. Full ride to Yale, full ride to Harvard, and then full ride to Tufts uh, dentistry. And he said, um, I've listened to your show. And I want you to coach me. And I, first You're like, I thought, you seem like you have it kind of, well, uh, you're, I, you're doing I, all right I, there. I'm sitting there thinking, <laughs> you, you should coach me. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, your resume is pretty, pretty awesome. <laughs> and yeah, you know, we got on the phone and, and I'd never done paid coaching before, right? I've been very generous with my time, but also um, I just want to give more than I get. So someone is doing me a favor being on my show. I, I, and it's not a, being on my show, someone does something nice for my kids. I mean, that's, that's the ultimate, right? There's mm -hmm. nothing I wouldn't do for that, that yeah. person. And, and I always want to give more than I, than I get. But in some cases, I am incredibly busy. I don't have a lot of time for myself. I have five kids, an amazing wife. How do you, you know, manage it all? You know, I work seven days a week and, and not stop. full days, not yeah. full days. I'm up um, early and when my, when my wife goes to bed, I'll sometimes go down to my office. Mm. You know, but I, I, I'm lucky. I love what I do, but Christian caught in, and I didn't even know what to price it at. So I, I set it extremely high. Um, I'm not going to, I'm well, going to tell okay. you just, just cause I don't want to be a lawyer. It's like, if he was going to, if he's, if he want to do it, want to do it. If he doesn't want to do it, yeah. I, I don't need it. Right. Yeah. He's like, okay, I'll take, I'll do it. Well, I, 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 I threw it out there and I, and he's like, okay, done said, all right, send me the check, five sessions. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll say it this way. He's going to do a promo reel for my website, um, and, uh, and we, which I mean, we're going to send a film crew out there. And he's grateful. But, but the truth is, and I say this in a very humble way, he said, you know, when I met you, I had no net worth. I was making $500,000 a year, 450000 to be exact. And a year and a half, I'm now worth $10 million. And... Um, it was just a few, few little tweaks and advice about his business and what he should do and starting a new practice that was, that was very helpful um, to him. So it's, it's, I, I take joy in it and the results of extreme preparation are 99% successful. That's incredible. 99%. And you're, he, you're still his mentor to this day? Yeah, I mean, he's had a lot of success. My team, uh, Matt, Ricky, uh, who also I work with, 
um, who's one of my mentees and now he's, uh, he's mentoring me in, in a lot of things, was a former intern. You know, we all met with them and they're going to help me with my, my show, um, help me with my coaching business and, and some other things that I'm doing. So tell us about the improv group and what your motto is. Don't think. <laughs> I went to Upright Citizens Brigade, UCB, and that is the motto, don't think. You know, just, just, just jump, go for it. So it doesn't make sense to analyze the situation, just jump right in and kind of put your blinders on? I think, I think it's a mix. I think the way that you work is very detailed and very admirable, and I respect that so much. And I think sometimes as an artist to be able to prepare, but then let it all go, I think there's freedom in that. So I think a combination, I would say. What are your goals with your career and in your life? Oh, there's a lot. How much time do we have? <laughs> I, I mean, I would love, I, I, I met uh, Taylor Sheridan at a Cowboys game a couple months ago, and uh, I had read this, I went up to him and I said, ah, oh, I read that article, I think it was in Variety or The Hollywood Reporter or something, and uh, he was a broke actor living in his car, and he went from that to building this empire of Yellowstone. And because of my Christian background and whatnot, I'm very interested in yeah. Yellowstone or 1920 or 18, what is it, 1883, 1920, all of the whole Yellowstone series. But he said, I learned pretty, pretty quick that you've got to create your own destiny. And so that's what he did. And, but to be a series regular in a show like Yellowstone or to be in a, you know, the Marvel universe, um, to do any of those big tentpole movies uh, would be incredible. I've got a laundry list of directors that I want to, you know, work with: Tarantino, um, Spielberg, Aronofsky, Woody Allen. There's a ton. Um, family life: I'd love to get married and, and have a family. Um, what else? You're single. Uh, yeah, seeing somebody right now. Okay. But not married. Okay. Yeah. So some I, I don't have a lot of famous friends. Uh, it's hard to crack into, you know, they're not going to call your manager and they don't have your phone number, but um, no offense to the guy that you're uh, dating, but the, <laughs> the, the way that people meet people is uh, DM. Yeah. Slide that's, up that's in how, the DMs. What's yeah. that? Slide up Slide in those DMs. DMs. Yeah. Slide into the DMs. <laughs> so uh, Joe Russo is going to do my show, so I'm very grateful for, for Joe to do it. I'm very excited. He, he did all the Marvel movies. Oh, nice. Um, second most successful director in history behind Spielberg, the Russo brothers. Really? So he, he's, I'm, I'm excited to have him Ooh. on my show. That's going to be a How did you one. guys meet? We're neighbors up in uh, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Okay. And there's oh, a group. Oh, it's beautiful up there. It's so nice. There's a group so table um, at a restaurant on our, in our residential complex and they seat you with people. Um, oh. at picnic tables. I mean, it, it's, it's a nice random? picnic table. Yeah, random. They see okay, you. Okay, that's cool. I'm sitting next to them and, and um, you know, just people don't really talk about work there. I mean, no one does. I mean, people there are, are generally where we live. It's a, it's a nice place. They're, they're well to do and you've got, you know, the Kardashians are in the neighborhood and Bieber's in the neighborhood. But you know, beyond them, it's like people are just regular people. They're regular people up there, yeah. right? No one's taking photos and, and we're sitting there and Jesse's with his kids and I'm with Madison, my wife, and we're just talking. And he said, you know, what do you do? And he, he, he was, there was a guy next to him from Nashville who was a friend of his who was in town and they said something about movies. They said, oh, are you? He's like, yeah, I'm a, a director. And I said, oh, you know, have you done anything? I would know <laughs> when I asked him. I mean, I felt like an idiot uh, when I went back and he Googled him, but, um, I, I Googled him because he, he told me what he had done. Okay. Uh, and I said, oh my gosh, you know, this, so he was so humble. So I thought it was great. So you like, want to be on the show? I didn't ask him and oh. uh, he, he didn't ask me. We're, we're going to conclude here. I always end my podcast with something I call fill in the blank to excellence. Are you ready to play? Ready to play. The biggest lesson I've learned in my life is? Be kind. My number one professional goal is? There's so many. <laughs> 
love to be in the Marvel Universe. My number one personal goal is? To get married and have a family. My biggest regret is? I don't have any regrets. The thing in my life that I'm most proud of is? My relationships with people. If I could land any part in a TV or movie today, the part would be? James Bond. The one thing I've dreamt of doing for a long time but haven't is? Winning an Oscar. If you could go back and tell your 21-year-old self one piece of advice, what would it be? Be nicer to yourself. The one question you wish I'd asked you but didn't is? Wait, what? <laughs> the one question you wish I had asked you but didn't is? Uh, I don't know. Um, you are the most prepared person I've ever met in my life and you are amazing and I am blown away. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you.